I'd like to begin with this uh, extraordinary riches which Tamara has given us and that image she just gave of Bartok. Now, many of you will know the beginning of the third string quartet, which has a lot in common with the beginning of the second violin sonata. And I want to begin with that constriction she talks about. It begins, as you all probably know, with a piling up of intervals, a semitone, a tone, and a major, so the major seventh. <laughs> from the lower instruments, and on the top of it, the solo vine plays home. And in that is, is kind of the microcosm of pretty much everything that happens, all the tensions in that, where he's, as he's famously said, I wanted to show Schoenberg how to use all 12 tones to still remain tonal. He was playing around, but we know what he's talking about, but it's mainly, if, if you think of it in terms of Foucault, it says, no such thing as truth. There are only multiple forms of constraint. That's from Foucault's History of Sexuality, which is not such a scary book as it sounds. It's incredibly important for us as musicians. But I want to begin there, and I want to dig back into the idea of sim simplicity and bring a rather less educated approach in terms of making talking about everything that's being talked about in one particular context to do with chamber music. But first of all, let's go back to the 18th century. Um, we've been listening to Kurtek playing with very little. But if you go back to Jean-Jacques Rousseau, the most varied piece of music in France in the 18th century, I have so far counted at least 80 variations published in Paris in this between 1767 and 1820. was a piece by Jean-Jacques Rousseau which does this. which he called naturally uh, a trois notes, uh, on three notes. And of course, in his mind is if you go to his Dictionnaire de la Musique and you go to his um, ancient music, he begins with what he purport, he pretends is an ode by Pindar. Uh, he gives this melody. So that's what's going on in France in the 18th century. And this is to point out that in many ways, what's fantastic about each century is there's a kind of reaching back to the past, the distant past, to find our way to the future. It happens in the 18th, it happens in the 19th century. I would argue that in the 19th century, the, the impetus comes very much in terms of the finding of simplicity and a way forward. It comes from the far north, particularly from what happens in Norway, but I may get to that. Um, so, but I want to introduce one element, which is a, a very simple idea, which is this. We're talking about all of this syntax and phrasing in the context of chamber music. And a very lovely idea is so you think of your favorite score of any piece of chamber music. What happens in the score musically between the parts is analog to what happens between the players on the stage. So... This is the most simple thing to imagine. We do it all the time, and it's a truism. It's something which is so obvious, it's a good idea to state it once or often, where when you have, and I'll get to questions of counterpoint maybe later, when the player does something on the stage, it is mapping what happens in the score. So, for instance, if you think of the beginning of Sibelius's Voce's Intime Quartet, first violin from one side of the stage, cello from the middle of the stage, not the other side. And any orchestral player, if you think of the Saint with the uh, of the Symphony Fantastique, with the image of the two shepherds from either side of the hill playing the Rans de Vache, the cow call, which comes from either side of the valley. And if you take a work such as Beethoven's great middle period um, uh, st string quintet, the um, Now that's laid out so um, uh, the right hand side, the left hand side of the stage, first violin, viola, and cello in the middle to start that. Then that hands over to the other side of the stage with the, the first, the second violin taking it, and then it's answered by the first violin. It's played from that side, and the first violin goes. <laughs> 
So the score is effectively laying out the stage. It's quite literally is a film director might talk about blocking the stage. And this has a really important, for me, an incredible impact on how we phrase, because phrasing and syntax and language happens in space, both the real space of on stage and the imagined space. I will not use the word virtual space. I hate that word. The imaginary space of the score. For all of us, for all of you, the score should be as real to you as hearing it. Music is your first language. When you read a score, however you enter it, you are entering fully into that. I think one thing I find from talking to younger musicians is they convince themselves that scores are a bit mysterious to them. The score is the place where you open it, like reading a book, and there you are in the music. However inadequate, I feel my score reading is terrible, but still I know when I open, you know, imagine the score of The Last Wound of Brandenburg III, for instance. Imagine those shapes snaking their way across the page, even if you can't, I've done this with children who can't read music, even children who can't read music can tell you, looking at that score, what's going on there. It's, it is music in that respect, and that's why it's so wonderful to hear talking about um, I'm thinking of, about some things by George Kurtak, for instance, the Schleidoyer um, piece for String Quartet, where you basically, apparently there's nothing at all on the page except these gestures, and you can see them happening. You, the very simple things to see. But let's stick for a moment with the idea of chamber music. I have to apologize right now to a couple of people who were in my talk yesterday, because I'm going to repeat a little bit of etymology. So, I, I, don't shout at me, Nina, and you were here yesterday, go somewhere else. Or if you want, at any point, if you get bored with me, which is pretty likely, go to the resource page I've provided, I don't care, and go and listen to actual music making as opposed to me actually plopping on. I will not be offended. What I'm saying is completely incoherent, so that's fine. But let's talk about language for a bit, because we are here talking about the roots of things. So the root of the word... Um, um, collaboration, which is what chamber music is about. Chamber music, obviously, in camera, it's in a room. You do it together. It has the Latin prefix co or con, which comes from the Latin cum, which means you do it together. So conversation, concert, collaboration, all of these things, cohabitation, all the things we're missing at the moment are fundamental to these things we do together. But of course, that has a deeper root, which is the root of the Latin cum is the Greek sun or sum, of things together, which is where we get symphony, syndicate, uh, synagogue, um, all of these things. And um, these things symbolize thing. A symbol is made when you put two things next to each other, sum balen in Greek. So for me, all music, whether it is you by yourself or with other people, cannot happen unless it has the essence of chamber music, because when music is played to somebody, the act of listening profoundly influences what we do, whether it's a prosaic manner. For instance, when Tamara wanted to demonstrate something, she wanted you to hear the octave in, usefully. She put it in a different octave. Now, that's a very pragmatic use of saying, I, these people need to listen to me, so I move it. So that, in many ways, you are affecting what she did. But we've all been on stage and found that a phrase emerged completely differently because we're being listened to. In fact, I think... Those of us who've been on stage a certain amount of time will be comfortable with saying that we have absolutely no idea what a piece of music is going to do until it is being listened to. In fact, I mean, sometimes people ask my wife what it's like living with a musician. She says, well, it's very quiet and there's lots of scratching about because the older you get, the more you realize there's absolutely no point in the practice from playing out because that won't teach you anything. What you need to do is you need to be with people. You need to have them. I mean, What's interesting about this, and I love to a degree about this nightmare of Zoom, is just like an audience, I can see you know, who's vaguely interested, who's bored out of their mind, who really wishes that this is the experience of being on stage. And we react. We, we quite literally ride that. At the end of a concert, you will come back. And if you're careful, you can actually examine. You can, you can play in your mind the experience of everybody in the room. So... With that in mind, I want to just throw a piece into the mix which roughly emerges round about the time that Bartok goes into maturity as a chamber musician. And this is perhaps the most important kind of breakout piece for chamber music in the 20th century. Uh, 
and that would be Stravinsky's three pieces for string quartet. Now, the reason I want to talk about that is it illustrates what chamber music does in terms of shaping by apparently breaking all the rules. If you want to, at some point, go, it's the well, first thing on my, on my resource page. If I describe it, in some ways, it's a little bit like what Bartok would do um, uh, a decade and a bit later with the third quartet. At the beginning, you have a dissonance laid out um, on, the, on the viola, uh, uh, a ninth, and then the cello starts playing, doop, boop, boom, beep, boop, boom, beep, boop, boom, which has nothing apparently to do. The viola holds onto that night with the pizzicato. The cello keeps repeating pizzicatos. They never do anything apart from exist in the same space together. Over the top, the first violin comes in mezzo forte, and the, my favorite Stravinsky indication, which he puts so often, glissé avec tout le lâché, longueur de lâché, to play with all length of the bow, which he uses again in Soldier's Tale. Um, you have this this figure. So that breath piece goes round and round and round and round. You go boom, 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 boom. And every so often, the second violin comes in. So that's we've had none of the tonalities have been linked. The first violin is a C, sort of C major thing. The second violin comes in like this. Every so often. The piece goes round in a circle like that for... Um, a minute and a half, and then you're done. That is it. There is no interaction necessary beyond the players. This, it behoves, this does nothing useful for the players if they respond to each other. No amount of looking longingly into each other's eyes is ever going to help that piece. By the way, I'd like to say right now, as a chamber musician, nothing is going to be learnt by looking to somebody's eyes. You need to actually look for actual information. Um, the eyes are, you know, I'm afraid on stage my eyes are the deadest thing imaginable. And if people who play chain music with me, they look hopefully at my face are getting absolutely nothing. That's not no, you know, chain musician is about the body, it's about how we listen, and it's how we look at the elements. If I'm playing with a flute player, I'm going to be watching their mouth, I'm going to be watching their hands, I'm going to be watching their back, everything, not their facial expressions. It really except with flute plays, what's interesting is the nose tends to bend very interesting. That's another story. So that image um, of, the, if you like, the completely unconnected string quartet, where people are in a room doing stuff together, which apparently doesn't link at all, only works. It only works because chamber music is about how we make links. Effectively, it's not a negative gesture. It is a kind of balancing gesture. And if you were to provide a balance to it, perhaps the most scary thing a quartet leader ever has to do, and years after playing for the first time, I'm still terrified, if you find yourself on stage having to go... I'm more scared of that than playing the beginning of the Beethoven Concerto. Because, obviously... That's the beginning of the fugue, which begins um, the Opus 131 string quartet of Beethoven. And it begins with that crescendo towards Fort Thunder and the piano. And each voice is going to come in after you. And each player's entry, to a degree or not, will be a critique of what you just did. It will either be that the players agree with what you're doing, or they disagree with what you're doing, or, it gets more interesting here, they will attempt to agree with what you're doing and fail. Now, this is one thing I want to bring into the question here. If you know David Sylvester, the great art critic, published a series of interviews with the artist Francis Bacon. It's perhaps the most important kind of bit of writing analogous to music that I know, apart from the Paul Clay pedagogical sketches, which have been kind of drifting around in the background of the conversation that Tamara was, was running. Um, if you don't know them, go look at them. Um, but... Bacon, who had one of the great techniques of any artist, was asked by Sylvester, so what do you do when you paint? And I've also thought any musician will recognize this. Here we go. He said, well, I have this really great idea. So I take the brush, I apply it to the canvas, and it's not what he intended. So the next thing I do is to another great idea, which will try and work with the accident that's just happened in order, as if to say, like Gimli in Lord of the Rings, I meant to do that, right? A, cor a corrective action, which doesn't have the fault of being a corrective action, but finds a way of owning 
what happens in order to work with it. Think of a pianist sitting on stage about to play the Schubert B-flat piano sonata. I can think of nothing worse than the horror of how you verse that voice that first chord. God say dank, we have nothing like that in the Wagner literature. The only equivalent, perhaps, is the slight frisson at the beginning of the Kreutzer sonata, but at least we get to play that forte. But the thing is that the pianist knows that once they've done that, it's going to affect everything that happens afterwards. Their speed of their scherzo will be affected by the voicing of that first chord, and those fingers will go down, and everything is mar mar marked off from there. Now, just going to bring into this a question of phrasing, which I learned from the composer Robert Saxton. I've worked with him since I was 18 or 19, and most of our work together has been conversation and discussion and meeting and, and shouting at each other, as we do with composers. And I remember about 15 years ago, we were recording a huge single movement string quartet he wrote called Songs, Dances and Ellipses. And he did something which reminds me a bit of what Tamara talked about with Kurtak and those two notes. In the recording session, he sat with our viola player. It begins with the viola kind of doing something which sounds as if it's going to be a minimalist, but isn't. It's closer to the, what a minimalist was think was minimalism, the beginning of Das Lied von der Erde. This, this kind of... Um, um, that kind of thing. But he sat with our viola player saying, no, 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 no. 15, 20 minutes, I'm thinking, okay, there's no time limit on this recording session. We can go all night, but this is going to get ridiculous. When he got what he wanted, he didn't say another word in the course of the session. But then I realized when I got to the very last page, when the first violin, me, has a kind of freak out. He knew what he was doing. Was He meant that instead of me coming off, I don't know, um, some small Danish hill at the end, I was hurling myself off the Jungfrau. Because what he did with that first phrase had enormous ramifications. If we were going to talk about this in terms of um, drama and poetry, we might use the word prolepsis. Prolepsis is from the Greek prolepto, and it, it's a word for dramatic irony. If you know your Shakespeare, in Act One of Antony and Cleopatra, there's a moment where one of um, Cleopatra's maidservants says, oh, I love a long life better than figs. There's actually only one possible reason for figs being mentioned there. It's because in the Act 5, the asps, which kill Cleopatra, by the way, you can't be killed by asps, that's another story, um, are brought in a basket of fig leaves. And this all links to something which the 19th century French theatre got very het up about, which is the dramatic unities. So much so that by the middle of the 19th century, there were enormous rows raging in dramatic circles in France as to whether it was possible, because of the unities, to say the word fourchette on stage. You couldn't refer to cutlery on stage because it might violate those things, which is one of the reasons that Richard Strauss wrote his Symphonia Domestica, was basically to play around with that idea. Now, Bartok sometimes plays with this in a naughty way. So the third string quartet, which has come up, and you, you might remember that at the end of the, 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 the last, the, 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 the piece turns itself, it gets faster and faster and faster and faster, but by the end, the figure which you've heard turns into just whirling scales. And by the end, he's decided he wants to bring these crashing um, displaced um, glissandos in the cello and viola. So you get a... Uh, while on the top, the theme you get that kind of thing going on the top. Now, Bartok is Bartok, and he's a bit worried because he clearly, and the one thing Bartok struggled with, just like Beethoven, he's in great company, was ending things. If you've looked, his struggles to end the, the second violin concerto, the concerto for orchestra, he, he knew his conscience was really a problem. Think of the cheat that Beethoven does to end the Opus 95 quartet. The fact that he ends a quartet begins like this. And you have that wonderfully miserable last movement. But he knows, because Beethoven never ended a quartet quietly, he knows he needs to find a big finish. So he ends with this kind of um, almost like musical. It has almost no business being there. He cheats. But Bartok is not prepared to do that. So in the third string quartet, he knows, because of the rules of dramatic irony, he wants to justify those glissandos. Now, there's a big section in the middle where there are contrary motion glissandos, which are kind of working out development session. That's not good enough. 
in the second section of the, the movement of the piece, there's a moment where the second violin, for no apparent reason, plays a glissando in the middle of the texture. I am absolutely sure that's Bartok's little kind of, now I feel all right, because I can say to he's in, perhaps that was originally in the texture, and I'm a Bartok freak, but I have a slight suspicion that he may have said, I need to do something, otherwise this is going to be on my conscience. It's not that it's it's we're talking about perhaps the most the tightest masterpiece of the 20th century for a quartet. There's a piece like a piece of bark. You can't take anything away from that piece. But the exciting thing about looking closely at the way the way something is structured is that when you look very closely, you'll start to see where there might be a tiny stitch. Some of you may use what I call motivic practice. Uh, this is something which I really love. If you take any piece of any piece of music and you're starting to learn it for the first time, and you select any figure, it can be anything. It can be staccato. It can be two or three notes. Chase all those down. Work them. Then then select another one. Keep chasing down shared figures. And by I can pretty much promise that in 90% of cases. By the end of maybe four or five hours work with a single movement, you will have covered nearly everything in the movement. But often there'll be just one little fragment left over at the end. And I've had this conversation with a number of composers. Very often that fragment is the equivalent to the piece of grit in the oyster, which started the whole thing in the first place. Because what's fascinating is that sometimes, and you've talked to writers about this, the thing which provokes a composer to write something is not the thing which necessarily gets developed. It can sit there and everything else flowers around it. You can have the opposite thing happen, but it's worth trying. Um, if you talk to, there's a lovely novelist called Patrick McGrath, who is a dear friend of mine, and I once asked him about how he wrote. And then this may not sound as anything to do with what we do, but I think learning how artists and writers build structures is very useful because we often we're kind of re having to kind of retrofit ourselves into the structure so knowing how it's built is useful and i asked him about the um uh, uh, him writing of the book um asylum which was made into a david cronenberg film with with sting you may have seen it and i see he said well it's quite simple so you write an outline and you start writing after you've written your outline and 10 pages in you realize your outline is a load of rubbish so you tear it up and you throw it away you start writing another outline he said, by the end of writing the book, you've got maybe a 300 word novel and several waste paper bins filled with outlines. That basically you're trying to work, the structure is something which is, it's fluid, it is alive. And I think that's something which is, as performers, we can use to find our way in a little bit. Um, it's interesting that Tamara brought up the Eroica Symphony. And that's a, it's actually, I'd actually put a version of that into my resource page. Some of you may know in 1807, this is nine years before the symphony was actually published. The symphony was only published as a in set of parts in 1816, but nine years earlier in 1807, and this is long before the transcription made by Ferdinand Ries. Um, there were a transcription ap uh, appeared, which may or not may or may not be by Beethoven. My theory is it's by Franz Clement, who led the early performances for piano quartet. Um, which we made the first recording of some years ago. And what was extraordinary for me was it did something which I hadn't expected. I don't have a life anywhere sitting near sitting in an orchestra. The last orchestra I sat in was when I was at the Academy. I, um, when I'm lucky, I play or record in front of orchestras and I play chain music and I play most of what I do is completely by myself. Um, but what's really fascinating to me about the difference, and I think this is important for all of us, the difference between playing, say, a piece, and this is a huge generalization, but it speaks to the question of phrasing, and heroic is useful, the huge difference between the phrasing which you might be necessary to play a contemporaneous piece of chamber music, Tor Eroica, for instance, and Eroica, is the speed at which things happen. Because the huge shock, and I'd never played Eroica until I did this, and after you step those 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 two big chords and you go off you go oh. you realize that as opposed to a beethoven string quartet where literally you're being hit round their face every moment with things changing just as you're even in the most relaxed of the violin piano, or piano violin sonatas that happens in the symphonies by comparison 
things, with the exception perhaps of the second symphony, which is you know, rather terrifying. I think it's more terrifying for orchestral players than the piano trio version, which is also a masterpiece, is that stuff happens at a very different rate. The, the huge long lines, which you find in Eroku, which you find in Bruckner 4, where it's kind of stretched out to the ultimate, you know, I think Bruckner realized he couldn't go any further with that. And then you get the seventh, which has got all kinds of big curls in it. But that's a very, very crude thing to observe. Just as there's, there's a difference between um, uh, Stravinsky's three pieces are doing the opposite to say what uh, uh, a conventional string quartet, whatever that is doing at the same moment. The same moment, the way that Beethoven inhabits instruments and combinations differs according to the intention and the number of people on the stage. So I included in the resource page a charming little duet he wrote, which flute players are always playing from 1792 when he left Bonn, which I love playing and it works wonderfully with two violins, with violin and flute. And this does almost no more. It's a gorgeous two movement thing, an allegro and a minuet of players playing in G major in similar motion or complementing each other, saying, doing what Tamara talked about with those, asking that question, is someone making a remark, oh, that's nice, oh, I don't know about that, oh, that's beautiful, that's great, no, I don't feel, that, which is so much the function of what we do as chamber musicians, often you can see that articulated most beautifully in what you might kind of so call kind of, the, I don't want to call second-rate music, but lighter music, music written for the salon, often works in the same way that conversation works in company, the way that people listen to each other around a table. Often you can find that, I would say better, but clearly expressed thus. Um, I want to back up now to the 17th century, because what's amazing about that, listening to um, the, uh, the, the poetry, and of course, when I'm listening to that, I'm longing to hear the beginning of Bluebeard's Castle, where you hear that all of that kind of roaring away. And I was really help, really pleased with what you pointed out to me about Hungarian, was that it was incredibly highly articulated, but it was not tonally varied. I, I'd really never noticed that before. But if we want to go back to when there is a time when music, particularly in in the UK, from UK and France, comes very, very close to the experience of speech and poetry, then that would probably be the 17th century. Um, uh, an example would be the music written by um, Le Sieur de Machy, uh, his piece de viol in the 1680s, where you get stuff that does this kind of thing. <laughs> And then, of course, then you get a doubler, which does the same thing. But I, I would never say a doubler is a variation. For me, a doubler is the composer re-inhabiting the same material with another version of what's in their mind. Um, if you think of the way that Bach does that in the B minor, B minor partita, going from book two, this amazing... Music where perhaps the greatest function the musician has is to make sure they don't get in the way of it. Um, perhaps in Bach, and I'm over interested in flute repertoire, so I apologize for this. This repeat re reaches a kind of ultimate reduction, and I urge any instrumentalist to try and play this. And Anna's going to hate me when you try and play. Mm. know trying to make that work and i know of no flute player who's not totally traumatized by that piece you know because it's the sense of how do you get from one note to another how do you get how do you how do you find your way through the the syntax the scansion of that because that's the thing which has been underlying nearly everything today is what poetry and music really share the sense of tactus the sense of feet the sense of stress and the relationship, which may be complementary or contradictory between the scansion of something, the material, and the meaning. These don't always agree with each other anymore, except very few occasions 
that a set of few subjects and answers and entries should agree with each other. The beginning of the Beethoven, I gave an example, there is a rare example of four players for five or six minutes agreeing totally with each other, which is why in some ways it's deeply horrible to play. Because you stand there thinking the only th he's got it's a little bit like I'm going to be rude. Do you remember in Amadeus where Mozart says, oh, these operas are about Greek heroes. They just sound like people shitting marble. The big problem with a fugue like that is how do you avoid that? And of course, Beethoven solves the problem with Opus 133. He says, this is the alternative, hurling rocks at each other. And these are both incredibly valuable. Um, but I think that's one of the things that really interests me is I've been talking about things being analog. The, there's an interesting second set of comparisons, if you like, between the way the score works internally, how that relates to the players on the stage, but also another thing. And a composer in the 20th century who did this extraordinarily was, was Prokofiev, which is how you could have a line which goes one way a, and a set of articulations across that line which contradicts it in order to give it energy. The most, the most obvious one example for me would be something like the some of the figuration in the second violin concerto, which does this, where the energy comes from things pulling against each other. Think of the beginning. I've talked about Antony and Cleopatra. That opening line, nay, but this dotage of our generals overflows the measure. His captain's heart, which in the scuffles of great fights, had burst the very buckles on his breast. Now renegal temper has become the bellows and the fans to cool the gypsy's lust. You'd never want to hear an actor say it like that on stage. That murders it. And I remember hearing Vanessa Redgrave talk about how Pentameter gave her the opportunity as an actress to acknowledge it was there and then push away from it. That what we need to do is to you know, have all of this understanding and then find a way to kind of not be hidebound by it. To kind of draw my kind of bit to a close, I want to then talk about one last thing. I talked about this yesterday in a different context um, with something called Stravinsky called the passport. And Tamara has been talking about it a great deal, which is one of the reasons, not the only reason, one of the reasons I love to work with living composers. And just like Tamara, a number of the composers I work with very closely have died on me. This doesn't change my relationship with them that much, I've discovered. George Rockberg used to find out where I was in the world and ring me up at three o'clock in the morning to check I was still practicing. He once achieved that when I was in Urumqi in Xinjiang, which was quite something. He's still ringing me up in the middle of the night. But the crucial thing here um, is the question of when the composer effectively allows us, gives us the, the passport, which is Stravinsky called it, to take on the mantle of the composer and to inhabit the music so fully that we are the voice and we're not worrying about them being the voice. So Kurt doing, and I've experienced him doing it to me with a Haydn quartet. He famously would do that to me with Haydn. You certainly is going, no, 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 no. And you're going completely crazy. And then you realize what's going on. The whole point is that we need to get to a stage with a composer's work so that we can move beyond that stage. And what we do is freed up. And working with a living composer can teach you how to do that with the dead one. I was very lucky that I had this over when I was very, very young um, with Hans Werner Henser, which means that I can honestly say now, if I take one of his greatest works, the Sonata for Viola and Piano, which I would say is, I put hand on the heart, I think is possibly the greatest 20th century work for Viola and Piano that I know. Um, but in order to play it, you need to know that the notation, the harmony, what's on the page, is barely 1% of what the music is. You need to um, trust that your instincts, just like being, say, directing a play, to shape your the music will only begin to happen when you start doing this. And even in the most complex music, I included a segment from Roberto Gerhard's second string quartet, which I think of as kind of a merciless mechanism of, of a, a piece, just like the pizzicato movement, the Ligeti II. There is no room for error there. But even a music like this doesn't work until you're free to, as Nietzsche would say, dance in chains. <laughs>
you can't dance until you have the change. In fact, that was something which Georges Enescu used to quote a great deal to his students. It was an, I thought it was Enescu until I realized it was my son smartly reprimanded and told me it was Nietzsche. Um, so that kind of freedom is something we can only have when we go through all of this. If you have to try on all of these questions so that we can move on from that. You can occasionally hear a composer doing it. And if you listen to one thing and one thing only from what I put up there, I do urge you to listen to um, Michael Finnis's continuation. He insists not to completion, but his continuation of the Contrapunctus 19 from the, um, the Art of Fugue, in which um, he found himself, after Bach drops off and goes blind, he found himself effectively traveling on a road with some of the other people who've played with that and then continuing and then stopping when he ran out of road. And I think that for me was a, a kind of lovely analogy for what we do. Again, think of Kurtag and his much lamented wife playing their Bach arrangements. That's, nobody's ever heard Bach like that before, but it sounds like the most real Bach I've ever heard, yet I can't imagine playing it like that. But, and I think that's, that's the freedom that perhaps we're talking about. And I think that would be a good place for me to call time, and then we can have some questions.